We left off at verse 6, verse 6, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. Now remember, uh, the author, he's trying to compare Jesus Christ with the angels. He's trying to point out that out of all angelic beings in heaven, Jesus Christ is superior to all of them. So this makes Jesus Christ very special. He's not like any other angelic being. That's the point of this author here. We've covered the last time about a heretical teaching and then the Catholic Council, the Orthodox Church, and everyone debating about uh, Jesus Christ at verse 5. At verse 5, there was a huge debate. Uh, when was he begotten? What is that verse referring to? As I've taught you before, that is easily referring that anyone would figure out when Jesus Christ was actually born was when he was actually born. I mean, uh, what's the only time period you can think of then? That's when he came down to this earth as a baby. I mean, what other time period was he begotten? Begotten means to be born. What other time period? Any fool can figure that out except PhD scholars who are religious. So that's the reason why, again, as I've warned you before and I've kept urging you, do not listen to higher ed or semantics, no matter how wise they are. The foolishness of God is always wiser than the wisdom of men. Whenever, uh, you always have to resort to the Bible, not to the wisdom of scholars. That's very important. But the evidence is verse 6 as well. Look at verse 6. This supports it. And again... When he bringeth uh, in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. So the author is quoting again another verse. That's what he's saying. When God brought in the firstborn, all right, Jesus Christ, into the world, God says, let all the angels of God worship him, Jesus. So that shows the superiority of Jesus Christ. And the author is quoting again from the Bible, and that's Psalm 97, 7. All right, so let me move this side, actually. That's where I should be. So in Psalm 97, 7, that's where verse 6 is comparing to. So we're looking at this checklist of how Jesus Christ is superior to the angels. So these are all what these check marks are referring to. That way you can follow along the context of what's going on here. Now, Notice when he's quoting from uh, Psalm 97, 7, it points out right here, when God brought in the first begotten, right? When was he begotten? Into the world. Oh, so when he was actually born in the world. So this has nothing to do with some eternal begotten day or whatever that the council was uh, arguing back and forth at the beginning centuries of Christianity. It's simple. It's when God brought the firstborn son into the world, when he was actually born. It's that simple. So verse 6 is proof again to debunk uh, the Catholic nonsense. Now, when did all the angels of God worship Jesus when he was in the world, right? When he was born. So then we'll look at the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This is the possible verse, all right? Amen. When the angels of God worshiped Jesus when he was born. That's what it's possibly referring to. Other people uh, will say that this is referring to when Jesus Christ uh, became exalted into heaven or when he starts ruling over the earth. I am open to those uh, interpretations, but I'm, uh, what I personally think is that because it says when he was brought forth into the world, when he was born, that's when the angels of God worshipped him. So I resort to that one. But if other Bible-believing preachers believe that it was at a different time frame, I am open to that. Luke chapter 2, notice that the Bible points out in verse 11, this is the angel speaking, okay? Luke 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So this was when Jesus was born into the world. Then all of a sudden, verse 13, notice a worship service from angels. Amen. Verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. 
So that's just my two cents on that one. Go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Now remember, this is literally word-for-word -word, uh, explanation, verse-by-verse -verse commentary. So as I explain each and every word from the verse, pay attention, see if it matches up, okay? Because you don't want to just take my word for it. Uh, you want to know every word in that verse, right, in that book. If you want to know that, then it is important to see if my explanations would match up to it. And your understanding would increase more if you're able to see how every word is defined as, explained as. All right, verse 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So concerning the angels, God is speaking that he himself, God, who is the one that makes his angels spirits, and then he also makes his ministers the same context, the angels, a flame of fire. They're fiery ministers. Now, that shows, again, the superiority of Jesus to the angels. That's what the author's trying to point out. Another verse that will prove the superiority. The superiority, it seems like, is that the angels minister to Christ. That's what it looks like. So they're the ones who are submissive to Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to look at Luke 20, uh, no, we're not going to do that. We'll, I'll show you that later on. But then uh, I do want to point out the verse that the author is quoting is Psalm 104.4. Okay, so that's what verse 7 is quoting, is Psalm 104.4. Now, there are two things to notice about the angels here, okay? Uh, I hate going back and forth anyway. All right. The angels, they are known to be spirits as well as fiery creatures, fiery beings. Now, angels are spirits. And in the Bible, there are five mentions of spirit, okay? Now, we're going to cover the five mentions here. The five mentions are as follows. First of all, go to 1 Corinthians 2, all right? 1 Corinthians 2. One is angels, and that's the first verse that proves it, is Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 7. You want to mark that one down, all right, to prove five spirits in your Bible. There are five spirits in your Bible. The first one is the angels, which we already read at Hebrews 1. The second one is man, all right, men, humans. So mankind has uh, a spirit as well. All right, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The uh, Bible points out, verse 11, For what knoweth the things of a man, save the what? Spirit of man, which is in him. All right, the third group is animals. Animals have their own spirit as well. I want you to go to Ecclesiastes, the last chapter, chapter 12. Go to Ecclesiastes, chapter 12. So animals also have their own spirit. Ecclesiastes, and then uh, we'll look at chapter 12, chapter 12. All right, the Bible points out at verse 7, verse 7, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So it points out right here that all spirits, uh, basically, once uh, death occurs, that the spirits will return to God. And then there's the passage that specifically says about the spirit of the beast going downward, and that will be Ecclesiastes. Uh, I lost that passage, actually. Was it chapter 4, maybe? So, was it 4? So let's go to 4, maybe. I think it was 4. Let me see here. So 12 would show all spirits returning uh, to the Father, but then it mentions about the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth, showing that the animals, they return to dust. That's the reason why there's a saying that uh, from atheists who don't believe in an afterlife, some of them will say, when we die, we die like dogs. What? Chapter 3? Thank you. Chapter 3. Verse what? 22. Thank you. Yes, sir, 21. You're right. Ecclesiastes 3, 21. 
So what do atheists mean by that? When we die, we die like dogs. They mean that basically that when you die, that you just return to dust. So the Bible does point that out concerning about the spirit of animals, actually. So Ecclesiastes 3.21. After all, atheists believe that they're animals, right? They come from animals. That's the reason why they have the mentality. Ecclesiastes 3.21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. So the animals, they return back to the earth. So this shows animals. Okay, four are devils. Go to Revelation 16. So demons, Revelation 16, we'll go to Revelation 16, and then I want your other hand to go to John 4, I want your other hand to go to John 4. All right, so the fifth one is God, obviously, the Father. He is a spirit. So the Lord God himself is a spirit. And then Revelation 16 will point out devils are also known as spirits. All right, if your hands are in both places, I'm going to start reading. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils. See that? All right, the other one is John chapter 4. And verse 24, verse 24, God is a spirit. See that? So the Father God himself is a spirit. So we see right here five cases of the spirit right here. One is angels, two is mankind, three animals, four is devils, fifth one is God. Now I want you to go to the book of Genesis chapter uh, 3. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 3. And then the other passage I want you to go to is Isaiah 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Again, they are Genesis chapter 3. And the other one is Isaiah chapter 6. Now look at this. You ever thought about why the Lord put a flaming sword in the Garden of Eden with angelic creatures? The reason why is because angelic creatures can withstand the flame. They can withstand the flame. So they are fiery creatures. It makes you wonder then, it makes a lot of sense about those fallen angels. Their proper home would be the lake of fire. See that? So it fits them as those creatures. All right, look at Genesis chapter 3. Notice in verse 24. 24. So he drove out the man... And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So notice that angelic creatures, uh, this certain class is cher are cherubims. They can withstand the flame. Now go to Isaiah 6. Here's another angelic class, seraphims. They can withstand the flames. Isaiah 6.6. 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Look at that right there. So this seraphim, he could take uh, a hot coal and be able to put it at Isaiah's lips in a way that wouldn't harm him. So angelic creatures can withstand fire. And we've seen that case at Genesis chapter 3, as well as Isaiah chapter 6. And these are referring to angelic creatures right here. We've seen two different classes of angelic creatures that can withstand flame. So it points out right here that angelic creatures, they'll be able to withstand flames. So think about this. Now, you're going to be like the angels of heaven, correct? That's what we're going to be at the resurrection. Go to the book of Matthew. I mean, we already know that's what's going to happen to us. Go to the book of Matthew. So if we have that ourselves, we can withstand the flame. See that? So we can withstand the flame ourselves. Go to Matthew chapter 22, chapter 22. Wow. Now people talk about when some meteors will fall down from outer space, like or when you pass through the Earth's atmosphere, or et cetera, the object has to be flaming burning, right? They would always demonstrate that in the movies or scientists would talk about it. It's, and there's fire around it. Well, you got to think about this. Those angelic creatures, that's not a problem for them. See that? Right. 
for them to go in and out through travel throughout the universe because they are fiery creatures themselves and they can withstand that. So they don't need a spaceship or anything like that. We ourselves, when we get raptured, when we have to pass through that universe, see, we can withstand it ourselves when we get raptured because our bodies will be similar to the angels. That's something to think about. Boom, flying comet like that, the flame, you know, that's passing around us, but just fast like that. All right, go to Matthew 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Here's another one. Go to Joel 2. Go to Joel 2. Joel chapter 2. Now, what, this is a passage that talks about the second advent. So who's coming down with Jesus at the second advent? Us, right? We are the army of the Lord that come down with him at the second advent. When they come down, they leave a trail of fire. Mm -hmm. See, they leave a trail of fire. Pointing out that we can travel through the universe without any problem at all. We can withstand the flame. We can withstand the pressure. We can withstand the heat. That's not a problem on our end. Go to Joel chapter 2. Notice right here, the Bible says... Verse 1, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. Second advent. But look at this. Verse 3, a fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen sh so shall they run. Look at this, the army of the Lord riding on horses, white horses with Jesus Christ. When he comes down at the second advent, he leaves a trail of fire, and in front of him is fiery too. So that's important to understand. Okay, so ministers of flame of fire, they're fiery creatures. Got to recognize that. Go back to Hebrews 1. Think about your supernatural resurrected body. Can you imagine that? An aura of fire. Praise God. So Can you imagine that? That's so cool, man. That's so cool. An aura of fire around you. Verse 8. Verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Yeah. A scepter Amen. of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All right, let me explain every word here and then uh, we'll uh, expound on that. So to Jesus the Son, God is saying, Your throne, O God. Yeah. So he calls his Son God. Amen. Your throne is going to last forever and ever. You're going to have a kingdom. You're going to have a scepter like a king. This scepter is righteousness. That's going to be the rulership of your kingdom. It'll be all done in righteousness. So it's a righteous, holy kingdom. It's not a tolerant kingdom, all right? It's not a kingdom full of love. It's a kingdom full of righteousness. That's the only way you're going to get a perfect kingdom on this earth, actually. Uh, look at the uh, kingdom of tolerance we live in, right? Now you're tolerating anything that's going on that is uh, tearing the world in half right now. Uh, verse 9, you, Jesus Christ, thou, all right, that's a singular term for you. Jesus, you, have loved righteousness. That's why he's always going to have a kingdom filled with righteousness. Jesus hates iniquity. That's sin. Jesus hates sin. Our world don't hate sin. They tolerate sin. It's a kingdom full of tolerance, an age full of tolerance. Therefore, God, even thy God. So, the author is saying, that's why God, even your God. So, notice right here, this is important to understand. Jesus is called God at verse 8. But Jesus has his own God. See that? So, that's not a contradiction. That's scriptural logic. All right? Now, I'll come to that later, okay? Uh, so, Jesus, uh, the God of Jesus Christ anointed him, Jesus, with uh, the oil of gladness. So that's what the oil, that's the anointing oil that's poured on Jesus' head. It's called an oil of gladness. That's what it's described to be. Above his other fellows, 
basically fellow people who also receive that same oil of gladness. All right, so I'm going to expand on this a little bit later, but let's go one by one. So first of all, is we're, uh, this is a passage that's quoting from Psalm 45, 6 and 7, all right? So verse 8 and 9, both of those verses in Hebrews are direct reference to Psalm 45, 6 and 7. Now, there are two things I want to point out right here. This is very important. Notice you have an Old Testament passage for Jews. Do you understand? Yeah. You have an Old Testament passage for Jews that proves Jesus is God. How about that, right? So if the Jews, they'll never believe Jesus is God in the New Testament, we'll show them the Old Testament. Who is that then? The Son is called God. And notice right here that God is saying to the Son, right? God is speaking to the Son, Thy throne, O God. All right? When did Allah ever have a son? Muslims deny that. When did Allah ever call His Son God? That would flip the Muslim right there. That's even far worse than that. So notice right here, Jesus is God in an Old Testament passage. So this debunks, notice right here, Judaism, where it denies uh, the Son of God being God, all right, Jesus being God. It also uh, debunks Islam, where they do not believe that Allah, or what they call God, uh, has a son, let alone the Son being called God. So what are you going to do about that one? And then three, it debunks the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, and other cults who uh, deny Jesus being God. Now, you know what they'll always do? They'll pull up passages. Let me show you one example, okay? How can Jesus be God when Jesus has his own God, they'll say, right? So here's one example. They'll go to John chapter 20. How can Jesus be God when he recognizes the Father to be God? He says, my God. Jesus says directly, my God. So how can God have his own God, be the same person, uh, be the same being, excuse me? That doesn't make sense. That's what they'll argue. So look at John chapter 20 and verse 17. Notice Jesus is speaking and he's saying that he himself has his own God. So that must mean that Jesus cannot be God himself, the same God. John 20, 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Well, the simple answer to that is this, is that uh, Jesus is talking about his human nature, not his deity. Remember, Jesus is, uh, has two natures within him. He has the, deity, the nature of deity and the nature of humanity. So he's speaking as a human being. That's why he says to Mary Magdalene, my God and your God. Why? Speaking on a human level here. But if uh, the logic doesn't make sense to the Jehovah Witness, tell them this. Well, then what are you going to do about this is biblical logic, not human logic, not my logic or what makes sense. This is God's logic, scriptural logic, because look at verse eight and nine. Mm -hmm. The son is called God. And while the son is called God, look at verse nine. It says, therefore, God, even what? Thy God. So the Son is called God, but He's also mentioned where your God, your personally, your own God, anointed you with the oil of gladness. So if you have a beef, have a beef with the Bible. So if a Jehovah Witness says, well, that logic of yours don't make sense, say, no, no, that's not my logic. That's Scripture. Look at the Scripture, what the Scripture says. They can't deny that then. So this... Uh, this is a great passage on the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, there are some people who are getting to this cultish mentality that Jesus cannot be God because Jesus has his own God. That doesn't make sense, and they'll use human logic. Well, it's because their peewee human brains will never comprehend that because this is, we're talking about God's logic, not human logic here. And God's logic is Jesus Christ is God, and he even has his own God like that. That's how God directs it. That proves the Trinity concept right here. Now, <clears throat> continuing onward, uh, like I mentioned at verse 8 and 9, Jesus Christ, uh, he is directly called God, but his God 
anoints him with the oil of gladness above his fellows. So the idea is this. Anybody who also received the oil, Jesus Christ was elevated above them when he received the oil. So this oil is called oil of gladness. And the reason why it's the oil of gladness is because a lot of times it has to do with uh, exuberation, exaltation. It has to do the height of your bliss. Because the priest received this, there are two people that you can think about in the Old Testament who received the anointing oil. Those are priests and those are kings. When they received the anointing oil, that was a position of high authority. So that's a very glad, high, lofty position. But in verse 9, it's arguing here that when God anointed uh, Jesus Christ, that he received that anointing that is above all other kings and priests. Amen. So, the next superiority of why Jesus is superior to the angels is because he's known as God. That's what verse 8 and 9 is pointing out. But also at verse 9 that he is a king or the person who received the anointing above all other people who received the anointing. So basically he's a king above all kings, a priest above all priests. He's a high priest. That makes a lot of sense now, right? So the reason why Jesus is called high priest is because of verse 9 you have to understand. He received that oil above all other priests. The reason why Jesus Christ is called king of kings is because of verse 9. He received that oil that kings would receive above all other kings. So that's what you have to understand. That's the idea of verse 9. Uh, verse 10 now, verse 10. Uh, uh, did I fail to mention the Psalm 45, 6, and 7? All right, that's what verse 8 and 9 of Hebrews 1 is quoting. All right, Psalm 45, 6, and 7. Verse 10, and, okay, so the author is about to quote another Bible verse then. So he's going to quote another Bible verse, which says, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands, thine hands. So meaning that uh, the scripture he's quoting from would, say, would state, You, Lord, uh, from the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, which we know that the foundation of the earth from the beginning, God is the one there that laid it, laid it down, that created it. And the heavens are God's handiwork. That's the idea, what it means. God's hands was the one that worked, created, designed the entire universe. The verse that it's quoting from, that you want to mark down, uh, in verse 10 through 12, is Psalm 102, 25 through 27. All right? Verse 10 through 12 is quoting Psalm 102, verse 25 through 27. If you wrote that down, then I'm going to flip the board. All right? Here we go. Uh, well, what joy. All right. Okay, more to the right, left, or? Uh, just to the left. All right here. All right, sounds good. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's see here. We're going to start off from this end. That way people can follow. I'm going to start off from this end. Oh, I hate dancing. Okay. All right. Um, so the heavens, the universe itself, is God's handiwork. Evolutionists, they deny that. They believe that the universe, when you study it, it's like billions of years old or trillions or God knows how long that they think. But they expect that when you study the universe or when you study science, it should disprove God. There's a lot of scientists when they enter the scientific community where they start to believe in evolution and they deny in intelligent design. But as a matter of fact, it's the opposite. If you study cosmology, if you study the universe, it should prove that there is a God. It proves intelligent design. But a lot of uh, scientists, they'll try to deny that or they won't believe that. But I want you to go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Now, that is not true because uh, there are scientists 
who study cosmology and they end up believing in God. Now, why is it that when people enter the science community, they start to deny God, they start to deny, uh, they start to believe in evolution? You want the easy answer? They never teach intelligent design in the classrooms. They teach evolution. Look, you cram evolution five years in a doctorate class, a PhD level class, and they're forced to study that, what, what, 16 hours a day or God knows how long? You're going to believe in evolution. Yeah. Let me give you a duh statement, all right? You put a, a, a person in a Bible-believing church 16 hours a day with Bible? They're not going to believe in evolution. They're going to become a Christian. So that's a really stupid thing to say. Oh, when they study science, they deny God they be and believe in evolution. Well, stupid, because they teach evolution. That's a really dumb thing to say. If I keep hearing that, I just want to shove it down their throat, okay? And then I'll say, why don't you come to my church then? Quit your PhD class, come to my church, and then you'll believe in God after that if I cram it 16 hours down your throat. Yeah. And that's a really dumb thing to say, you know? Yeah. Because when you go to science class, the reason why they believe in evolution is because evolution is being taught. But you put intelligent design there, you'll change their thinking, man. You'll change their thinking. Go to Psalm 19.1. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day unto uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That is so true. So that verse is pointing out that God's heaven is so, uh, it screams out the universe itself, right? So I'm only talking about the universe. I'm not even talking about DNA or anything else like that. So just the universe itself, if you were to study that, it, point, it screams out that there is a creator. As a matter of fact, scientists do admit that. So uh, here's one example. I'm going to, uh, one is evolutionists. So evolutionists who study cosmology, they ended up still believing in evolution, but recognizing that there had to be a God. It can't be done by random chance. So I'm not giving, so Hugh Ross is an example. So Hugh Ross, he is not a creationist, guys. Okay, understand that. He is not a creationist. But this guy who believes in evolution could not deny that there is a God. He started out as an unbeliever, and then he had to end up believing in Christianity because of that. So I'm talking about an evolutionist. I'm not talking about a Christian creationist here. So here's an, so there are cosmologists who studied it, and then they recognized that when they studied the universe, there had to be a God. You can't do it just by random chance. The reason why is because uh, there is one argument which is called fine-tune argument. It's another uh, word for, believe it or not, intelligent design. But the, more, but the term that you want to look up, and there are way too many scientists on this one, on fine-tune argument. But the fine-tune argument, basically it goes this, is that the universe is designed or it was like tuned so finely in a way where it's going to be impossible for life to exist had it not been fine-tuned to begin with. So in other words, it had to begin that way. It couldn't just go through a long process of time and tune itself up. It couldn't create itself because the universe, when you study it, every detail or complexity, uh, element, particle, everything, energy, space within that universe, it was designed in a way, and it's so precise in its uh, design that if it was a, just a little bit out of place, you destroy all of life. You destroy all of life. Now then, the evolutionists, how they'll try to argue against fine-tuned arguments is that basically, which is true if you study all elements in the universe or in science, these elements through randomness, without explanation, they, they try to survive. So because they always go for survival, that's why they claim new information can eventually come out and then evolution can come out. There are changes that happen. So that's their argument. But here's the problem with that argument. The problem is we're not talking about one element here that's changing, yeah. okay? We are talking about yeah. that if one element changes, all the other elements within the universe, then you'll damage the whole process. Yeah. So in other words, 
this element and this element and all these elements are interdependent on each other, interconnected. They are interconnected so much in a way that if you change them, or if randomness happened where anything changed and that affects everything, then you destroy all of life. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that all of these things are interdependent, interconnected to each other, where they, if they did have changes or evolution, it's not just for survival. So they think that the universe is designed this way because of survival. No, this is more than that. This is a problem. It was designed for it to be inhabited, yes. habitable. Yeah. So in other words, if I was one of these elements or, ener uh, or these energetic particles or whatever, I'm not just surviving. I was already jumping so much and became a star, became the universe, became what it is so that somebody can actually live in there. It was designed everything in a way where human life can exist and live. That's the idea. So let's take it this way for example, okay? Let's say you're an astronaut and you're walking on a planet, you know, if you're a flat earther, you don't believe me, then that's okay, fine, you know? Uh, I'm just giving this as a hypothetical case, okay? So you can put a different illustration, I don't care. But let's just pretend uh, that you're an astronaut and then you're landing on a planet and then all of a sudden, you see this uh, beautiful uh, home or habitat. It's got uh, running water. It's got the food uh, laid out in the fridge, table, and everything. When you look at that, you'll automatically assume that because everything was fit into place for a person to live there. Not just surviving, but a person to live there where the food was in the refrigerator specifically for me to eat. The water is running in that faucet specifically for me to wash my hands. So here's the problem with the evolutionists. Everything in the universe, see that? Like the faucet, the food in the fridge and all that, everything different out there was put all into place at once for somebody to live there, to use. See, that's the problem. So their arguments against fine tune is weak on that one. The arguments against, the evolutionist arguments against fine-tuned arguments is very weak on that one because everything was fit into place for living, you gotta realize, for us humans. Think about the atmosphere for humans to breathe, the water there for the humans, the land over there for the humans, and the humans receiving oxygen, and then also the plant life already there for the humans to eat. What are the chances of that within the billions of stars, uh, within the galaxies out there if the universe is that big, right? Everything, and then the sun right in its position where the humans could receive the warmth, where they don't get burned up. See, that's the point right here. This is not just one little thing with another little thing and another little thing, and they're all surviving, and then it became this way. No, everything had to be put into place at one shot, you have to realize, for a group of people to live. That's huge. Amen. That shows humans are not just a random speck. The whole universe was created for us. That's really big right there. So that's fine-tuned arguments. So then uh, uh, scholars that uh, you can look up to is like uh, Hugh Ross, and then the other one is Stephen Meyer. He'll also argue that one. And then just look up fine-tuned arguments. Even Richard Dawkins admitted fine-tuned argument is actually a very good argument for the existence of God. But then he's saying, but what about the resurrection of Jesus? What about the virgin birth? I can't believe that. See? But he can't argue against the existence of God with fine tune, huh? Yeah. See, so he's even relenting to that. Even, uh, I think his name is Michio Kaku, yeah. had to admit that as well. So then uh, here's another thing to keep in mind. We get fine tune arguments. Another one is this. Another one is the comparison with, uh, there was a hand to it. So there was a hand to it versus accident or randomness. That's another issue. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his what? Handiwork. Okay. Basically, if uh, you are in a casino and then... Uh, Again, hypothetical, Don't get, Christians shouldn't get mad at me, okay? Just hypothetically, okay? Everyone's so sensitive who watches online now, okay? 
So I'm not saying you should gamble, obviously, all right? So, but pretend that you're in a casino, the dealer uh, was laying it out, and then uh, you're playing cards with somebody, and then when you're playing cards, you don't have a good hand, okay? But the other person's hand was really good. It was like a royal flush, okay? Then you, chance, right, and randomness. And at first we go, oh man, that guy was lucky. He was able to guess it. But let's say it happened twice, royal straight flush, all right? Then you, uh, what would the professional uh, casino players, or I don't know what they call those guards, the casino bosses or something like that? Pit boss, right? Pit boss. I mean, when they look at that, then they're, are they gonna think, oh, that's just randomness? Or are they going to think, I better keep an eye? Then let's say it was five straight royal flushes. You know what's gonna happen? Then the casino and any professional player is not going to go, oh, it's just random. No, they're gonna go, there's a, there's a deliberate hand to this. If you get 20 royal straight flushes, which is the odds of it happening is like, what? Then you know, look, man, there was a deliberate hand to this. You're not gonna go, oh, that was an accident. No, you wouldn't. No one would do that if your money was at stake, all right? No evolutionists, no Richard Dawkins, Michio Kaku, and then Lawrence Krauss, and then all these fine idiots, all right, would say, oh, it was randomness, let me lose my money. No, they're going to, their common sense will finally kick in against their PhD uh, own arguments and reasoning and go, no, there's a deliberate hand to this. Do you realize that all of this in the universe, the chances of it happening is more than 20 royal flushes? Where any one thing which is out of place would destroy all of life. No one's going to, no common sense person will call it accident. They'll say there's a hand to this. There's a deliberate hand to this. The heavens are his what? Handiwork. That's the word of God. So when you do the comparisons, this speaks really loud right there. Truly, day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. No speak or language where their voice is not heard. Because scientists, when they study the universe, they see everything in that universe where it's screaming out its fine tune. There's some god or some being who's, who did that. Now, this is from Michio Kaku himself. This is very interesting. He said this. I was going to write that quote over here, actually, but I didn't have uh, time. So I'll just make a brevity of it. He says in his book, Parallel Worlds, A Journey Through Creation, Higher Dimensions, and the Future of the Cosmos. He says this, Scientists have in fact assembled long lists of scores of such happy cosmic accidents. See that? He calls it accidents. When faced with this imposing list, it's shocking to find how many of the familiar constants of the universe lie within a very narrow band that makes life possible. If a single one of these accidents were altered, stars would never form, the universe would fly apart, DNA would not exist, life as we know it would be impossible, Earth would flip over or freeze, and so on. Would you believe that? This is not a saved Christian right here. This is one who supports evolution, Michio Kako. How about that? So, there's no doubt. I mean, this is like one out of a million times a billion, etc. Study everything in that universe. If one thing goes out of place in the star with uh, gravity, space, or everything of how uh, outer space works, and the density of certain, I guess, mass or particles, whatever they want to call it, if anything is out of place, you destroy, you can just ruin everything or even life itself. You got to realize that. You can't just argue that there are changes through randomness and accident. Sure, that happens all the time. But when the, all of them are interdependent on each other, that's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. Then that'll just destroy everything. So the reason why the fine-tuned argument still stands out is because this is not just survival. This is not just survival, randomness, or changes. This is more than that. It's also, uh, everything is interdependent. It's made to be habitable, inhabited, livable.
Basically, let me write this. It is made for humans. It is made specifically for you. That's how the universe was designed to be. That's insane. That's crazy. So what are you going to do about that? Chances of all this happening? No way. No way. All right. Now let's cover this part right here. All right. Returning back, uh, we're going to cover some interesting doctrines. All right, let's go to Hebrews. You all having fun? Amen, bro. All right, let's go to Hebrews 1. Praise the Lord, amen. Go to Hebrews uh, chapter 1. And then uh, we'll look at uh, verse 11 and 12. 11 and 12. The Bible says, Hebrews 1, 11, They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So, in other words, let me exp explain every word. The heavens, all the universe, they will die out. They will fade. But God will always remain. Jesus will always remain. That's why he's still superior, all right? And they all shall wax old as doth the garment. All the st uh, stuff in the universe are going to wax old. That's a, fr a f common phrase in the Bible about becoming older, like really older, stricken. Like a garment, like a clothing would, okay? Getting old and then being worn out. That's the idea, getting worn out. Verse 12, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. So like a vesture, God's going to eventually fold up the universe like a vesture. Okay, that's important to keep in mind, his clothing. And they shall be changed. So the whole heavens and universe will change. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But Jesus, or God, will always remain the same. His years will never fail. It won't run out. Now, I want you to uh, go to Isaiah 40. Go to Isaiah chapter 40, and then I want to try to respect the time while covering all the essential doctrines. Okay, go to Isaiah chapter 40. Dr. Upman has some good stuff right here that I'm going to try to cover. All right, go to Isaiah chapter 40, and then we'll look at verse 22. Verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Notice right here, the universe was created to be lived in. See that? That supported what we argued earlier. But also right here, notice that it's like fabric. See that? It's like fabric or clothing. That's what the universe is described as. You might say, why is that? Because, uh, look, uh, I think a good verse would be Ephesians. Go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians. For some of you who don't know, the universe is God's clothing, actually. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, verse 20, Ephesians 1, 20. So notice right here that the universe is described, all right? So this triangle shape is the universe, I want you to understand. Like a vesture, right? That's why it is a triangular shape, the universe. As a matter of fact, scientists, or I think mathematicians, how they, do, how they measure the universe is through triangles. So we argue the universe is a triangle. But then when we argue about the Trinity, see that? If we're going to put it in a dimensional plane in a human perspective, it's what? A triangle right here. Now, look at this. That's why we argue the universe is in a triangle, because God, this is referring to God's clothing. God fills up all the universe, it says. So if he fills up the whole universe, that universe is like practically, see, his clothing. Yes. So look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the what? Heaven. Heavenly places. So this is the heavens, the universe. Look at right here, verse 22, 22. And hath put all things under his feet. So that's referring to the entire, everything in creation. 
okay? Or the universe, whatever way you want to call it. But all of it are belong to Jesus Christ, verse 22, and gave him to be the head over what? All things. So Jesus is the head. Look at this. That's why God sticks out as a head. Jesus sticks out as a head. That's why Jesus Christ is known as the head quite often. But notice right here the next part, over all things to the church, which is his what? Body. Body. Well, that's the church. But notice it's more than that. The fullness of him that filleth what? All. all in all. That's all creation itself. Look at that. So notice right here, God is the head. And then the universe itself is his clothing because he fills up everywhere. That's the reason why his vesture, the Bible says that when he creates a new heaven, new earth, go to Revelation 21. Go to Revelation chapter 21. When God creates a new universe, like Hebrews says, God will one day get rid of this current universe and then replace it with a new universe. What God's doing is he's getting rid of that corrupted creation, the universe. He's going to take it off like his clothing and then fold them up and then have a new universe. Go to Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So a new heaven, new earth comes in. The first earth, the, heaven, the first heaven, the universe, what? Passed away. It goes away. It wears out. See that? That's why the universe is bound to the second law of thermodynamics. Hebrews 1 proves that uh, the second law of thermodynamics is running in our universe. And the law of entropy. Basically, uh, the universe is dying out. I mean, scientists even admit that. The universe is dying out. The earth is dying out. That's why we got to do climate change. Haha, <laughs> very funny, you know, these guys. You know how, if they admit there's such a small speck in the universe, how are they going to survive, these people? See, if they admit the whole universe itself and everything is dying out. So then what are you going to do? Because the Bible uh, binds it to the second law of thermodynamics or law of entropy, whatever more accurate term you'd perceive it as. So we see scientific proof of the universe supported by law of entropy. Second thing, God is using that law of entropy where he's going to truly wear it out, where sometime in the future in Revelation, he's going to get rid of it, his old clothing, and put on new clothing. Now I'm going to talk about this part, which is extremely interesting, okay? And then I'll close it off. So when God gets rid of this corrupted universe, this old clothing, what does that mean? Once it's gone, he's naked, right? When he's naked... What does naked mean? Now keep your hand here. Keep your hand here at Revelation 20. We're going to look at Revelation 20 later. Go to Hebrews 4. Uh, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Naked, keep in mind, has two meanings in the Bible, okay? It has two meanings. It means to be open, nothing hidden, nothing you can hide. The second thing it connects, uh, which we know is our nakedness, we know what that means, but it's connected to birth and our seed. I'm going to show you that later on. Now, first of all, it's open, right? That's what it means. Hebrews 4 is the evidence. Hebrews 4, verse 13. Hebrews 4, 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are what? Naked and open. So that means nothing can be hidden. It's open. Okay. So, if you get rid of this universe, God's clothing, what happens? He's naked then, correct? Mm -hmm. When he's naked, what happens? He's so open without a covering. You remember what Moses and people had to do when they look at God's open self? Yep. Everything in his open form, they had to put a covering. They had to put a clothing or covering. Because they can't stand the sight of God's naked, open self. If that universe is gone, what's going to happen when you have God's naked, open self throughout all of creation? That universe won't survive, man. And those souls who are burning in hell when they go before the great white throne of judgment with God's naked self, open, holy glory, you think those damn souls can stand that? 
They'd sooner want to jump into the lake of fire, to be separated from God's open, holy presence. A lot of people think that the lake of fire is God's cruelty. They don't know this. It's actually God's mercy a lot of times. It could be God's mercy because they can't stand the sight of being in heaven with you without sin. When they're with sin, that, that's going to collapse everything. Go to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. That's something, yeah? yeah. That's something right there. Look at Revelation chapter 20. If you don't believe me, look what happens when God gets rid of the universe, gets rid of the clothing, when he reveals himself in his holiness. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a gray white throne and him that sat on it. From whose what? Face. That's not hidden. When you see God face to face, what happens? You die. So this ain't hidden, his face. From whose face? So it's open now. The earth and the heaven, what? Fled away. And there was found no place for them. Nowhere to run or hide. Verse 12, those people being brought to the great white throne judgment before they're cast into the lake of fire. That's something, huh? That's something. They can't stand that. That would be an awful sight. Um, now, I'm going to show you something here. Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. So when he's naked, it's pure. Can I repeat that again? When he's naked, it's his complete holiness that you're witnessing. Is that correct? We saw that so far. Now, here's the thing, all right? I'm going to try to be as uh, modest <laughs> as I can. But then a lot of people, they try to think grotesque stuff when they come to Song of Solomon, right? And then try to see sexual imagery and they'll say, man, how can a holy God put something like that in there? Well, hey, hey, hold on right here, okay? They think nakedness is a bad thing. No, nakedness is a good thing. But why is it that we Christians make a big deal about not exposing nakedness? Here's the key. All right, let me connect it all together. This is really interesting. All right, go to Genesis 2. All right, let me wrap it up. All right, let me wrap it up. Genesis 2.25, right? Adam and Eve, they were naked. Was that a shameful thing? Was that a bad thing? No. Why? They were in innocence, yeah. Yeah. holiness, yeah. Yeah. purity. Genesis 2.25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. But what happened when they partook in sin? See that? When they partook in sin, that nakedness is no longer holy and pure. It's shameful. Now look at this right here. This is going to be incredibly eye-opening for you. You know why you see grotesque stuff as Song of Solomon? Simple. Because you and I are in a corrupted state. Yeah. So when naked descriptions are brought out, our corrupted flesh brings up a corrupted stuff into our corrupted minds. Yeah. But to a perfect, pure God, yeah. that naked stuff is holy and pure to Him. That's the reason why he said when a man and wife marry, he says the bed is undefiled. It's holy. In God's sight, the marriage. That's why he takes fornication seriously. Why? That's outside of God's sight, outside of God's standard. When you do that, that is corrupted and filthy. This is incredibly eye-opening right here. An author like God can write Song of Solomon. Do you understand that? Because this is holy and pure to him. Corrupted man cannot stand that. That's why corrupted man has to. You know what we do as preachers when we talk about naked topics? We have to put something as a covering. We have to hide it like I'm doing now. What do you do with God's naked face? You hide it, cover it so you don't die out. What does man do when it covers naked topics? You have to hide it. You have to cover it. You have to put a filter. Adam and Eve knew that. That's why, what did they do? Verse 7, Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They were ashamed for God to see them that way, in their corrupt estate, in nakedness. See that? That's why they have to hide it and cover it. That's why we Christians, when it comes to nakedness, it's a shameful thing when that's all openly exposed by wickedness of man. It should be hidden. It should be covered. Now, this is... Uh, 
Let me wrap it up, okay? Let me wrap it up, okay? Let me, let me say this quickly, okay? So one verse is uh, uh, Genesis chapter, I think, 17, right? Genesis 17, uh, God says that those Jews, uh, no, no, let's start out one by one, okay? Nakedness is connected to birth and seed. How do we know that? Job chapter 1, all right? Job 1, Job said, naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. So he's saying when he was born, he was naked. So birth and seed, see that, is connected to nakedness, okay? Now, when he is born, his seed, his birth in nakedness is full of shame. It's corrupted, okay? So God has to, God sees this as corrupted. So that's why God says to mankind, you know, hiding and covering it, right? But another thing. What man has to do? Circumcision. Why do you think that God wanted that kind of procedure and operation on that particular part of the body? You know why? Because the reason why is their birth and seed is corrupted. That's why circumcision was necessary as part of their salvation. Part of that relationship with God in the Old Testament. But then what did Jesus Christ do? Jesus Christ took on the shame of corrupted man by being naked himself on the cross. He took the nakedness of sin and shame, nailed it to his cross, and that's why I write down Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2 said it was nailed to the cross and he provided a different circumcision to cut off that corrupted birth seed. And that was spiritual circumcision. And that's the reason why the Bible says we are born not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. That would have been cool if we went through every verse one by one like that, all right? That would have been very cool, all right? But anyway, let's close it with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the people, Lord, to open our eyes more about the doctrines and the truths of your word, why you wanted circumcision to begin with, why our salvation is full of circumcision, why the universe and creation and the great white throne judgment, all of this involves with that nakedness, Lord. I, and uh, all the other doctrines we learned from the book of Hebrews, I pray, was a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.